This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello, and welcome to the Sunday Social on Teachers Talk Radio with Anna Hudson. We're just connecting up Anna now, and she's going to be speaking to you in about three seconds' time. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday Social with me, Miss H Teachers, aka Anna Hudson. It's absolutely lovely to be back. Thank you for joining me today. I am so excited to once again be talking to you about all the things that I and I hope you are most passionate about. So firstly, as we do every week, just want to do a little check in. How are you? How has your week been? How are you feeling today? Are you making the most of your Sunday? Are you ready and raring to go back to school tomorrow? Are you hastily making Christmas plans now that the Christmas countdown has well and truly begun? Or are you feeling a little bit nervous or anxious about the week ahead? How has your mental health been affected by this week? Do you need a little dose of excitement this week to keep you going? Do you reach out to friends? Have you got people you can talk to? I really hope you do. And whatever you're feeling today and however you're feeling and wherever you are, thank you for listening and thank you for supporting Teachers Talk Radio. So let's get on with the show. Today's show is all about the power of alternative provision. So what do you know about AP? Have you had experience of working in them? Do you think that there are lessons that can be learned from AP and brought into mainstreams? Do you think that AP is a positive thing? Today, we're going to talk about all things AP. And I am very, very lucky to welcome some very, very special guests on today, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Um, But firstly, we need to dive a little bit further into what AP is. So. What is AP? Well, it stands for Alternative Provision. Alternative Provision, loosely described, is a provision for children and young people who can't access mainstream school. Now, whether that's because of exclusion, whether that's because of SEMH needs, SEND needs, or medical illness, Alternative provisions are there to support some of our most vulnerable children and young people. Government statistics tell us that there are currently 335 APs in the UK, and these can include PRUs, sports facilities, independent provisions, SEMH schools, vocational provisions, and outdoor learning. The list is quite truly endless. There are some fun facts I learned while researching um, this show this week. Most pupils who access AP are boys. In fact, it's a staggering 70.6%. And half of state-funded pupils accessing AP are eligible for free school meals. 55.8% of referrals to alternative provision are for behaviour support. Within that 55.8%, 20% had EHCPs and 42.5% were in receipt of SEN support. I was quite shocked by those figures. Are you? What are your experience of referrals into AP? If you would like to contribute to today's show, I would more than welcome you to come on and speak. Please feel free to do so. Just simply click on the little microphone on the left hand side and request to speak or if you'd rather send me a dm please do so i'd love to hear from you so as i mentioned before alternative provision doesn't always adhere to the one size fits all and in fact most times they're much more varied in focus so what are prus like and what do they offer well Like most alternative provisions, as I said, most size doesn't fit all. 
But there are some standard offers that you'll see in the majority of alternative provisions and indeed pupil referral units. Smaller classes, flexible cl curriculum and classroom offers, higher ratios of staffing, larger pastoral teams and a more intense pastoral offer. I am um, working in an AP and I can honestly and truly attest particularly from my experience of working in a pro, that working there allows, and those smaller classes, allow staff to tackle the relevant issues directly. So whether that is mental health, antisocial behaviour, SEND needs, the power of alternative provision, and in my experience of PRUES, is that those smaller class sizes, those abilities to be flexible with an overcrowded curriculum, that high level of staff and pastoral support really do make a difference. Now, for many mainstream colleagues, one of the biggest things that they face is when trying to gather evidence for educational healthcare plans. One of the great things about working on alternative provision, and in my experience of PRUES, is that it is really easy to gather that evidence. Why? Because you are working at sometimes one-to-one -one with those pupils. And as a result, you are able to gather that evidence much more quickly and in much more detail. It also allows those who are children who are most vulnerable to receive that real intensive support. So... If this is the case, if there is so much positivity around AP, around PRUES, around what alternative provision can offer, then why does AP have such a bad rep? This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. In today's educational environment, students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face, -face, online and blended learning courses. Canvas by Instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly, and access actionable data that drives student success. On the 24th to the 26th of January, 2024, Bet UK is back and even better for educators. New for 2024, Table Talks empowers educators to collaborate openly and connect deeply with like minded individuals in the education space, as well as tech user labs, the brilliant new tutorials, and working groups at BET, where technology users will learn how to get more out of their institution's tech from the top education technology experts in the world. Whatever your goal, you'll find it at BET 2024. Educators go free. Get your tickets today at www.uk.betshow.com forward slash visitor dash registration. Proofs, for example, have been described as school to prison pipelines. I know myself that when I tell people that I work in a pupil referral unit, I often get a really charged response. Uh, in fact, I once, when I said that I was going for a job in a pro, was told to think carefully before I applied for one. Now, my experience has been really positive. And in some ways, I do think alternative provision is a little bit like Marmite. You either really, really like it or it's just not for you. And that's absolutely fine. But there really does seem to be a stigma still around alternative provisions. And I have to ask why. Colleagues who are listening, why do you think that is? Is it the fear of the unknown? Is it the perceptions that all pupils who go to pupil referral units in alternative provision are simply there because of behaviour? 
how much do mainstream teachers actually know about alternative provisions? There is a growing rise in children and young people accessing APs. Should all teachers have the opportunity to experience an AP, whether that's on a placement or a sabbatical or at least a visit? As I said before, when I was researching some of the statistics around this show, I found out some more really interesting information that I'd not really considered before. For example, in 2022 and 23, data tells us that 24,577 children were referred to alternative provision. That's a lot of children. Do we know about the destinations of those children? Do we know what their journey to AP and beyond is like? How can we best support those children who maybe need to access alternative provision if we have no experience of them? In 2021 and 2022, 11,684 children accessed a PRU. In 2022 and 23, it was 13,191. That is a huge jump and it's only increasing. Why is this? Well, one of the routes into a PRU is through permanent exclusion. And the DV, they published their permanent exclusion and suspension data for 2021 and 22 in July. There were 6,495 permanent exclusions in the UK. This was up from 3,928 in 2020, 2021. 578,280 suspensions. Wow. That is a lot of suspensions across an academic year. And that is up from 352,454 in 2020, so why are we seeing a staggering rise in young people accessing alternative provision? Why are we seeing this staggering rise in permanent exclusions and suspensions? Well, our radio shows at Teachers Talk Radio explain some of it. We are seeing a high rise in challenging behaviour. We know that there are ever increasing issues around it. And we know that there are staff who are desperately trying to support children and young people to the best of their ability. We also have feedback from other school staff who say that there's simply too much overcrowding in the curriculum. And that as a result of COVID, young people's mental health is struggling and the demands of that overcrowded curriculum are too much. Whether it's SEMH need, whether it's SEND, whether it's an unmet need or an inability to access a mainstream setting, the evidence is clear that there is a rising problem and that there is an ever growing need for more alternative provision and for more alternative education. Now, how do we challenge the stigma around PRUS? Is it because of the destinations? Is it because of the offer? Is it because we don't really understand what educational input is given in a PRU and an alternative provision. There are some negative statistics around AP, particularly for key stage four destinations. There was some data published in October 2023 that said only 60%, 67% of pupils from AP went on to a sustained destination. And that's compared to 93.6% of mainstream pupils. It also said that a third of key stage four pupils in AP didn't sustain the destination for the required six months, compared to 52% of their mainstream cohorts. That said, key stage four pupils accessing AP were more than likely to go into employment, 11.2% compared to the 4% of mainstream. Now, this could be due to mainstream pupils accessing further education, but it also could be because of the vocational offers that many APEs have and the skills that those young people acquire. So if there's so much stigma and negativity around AP, 
Is there any lesson to be learned from them? Or can they be a happy place and a place where young people can thrive? I can't answer that question. But today I am incredibly lucky to be joined by a very special guest, George Baldock. George, I hope that you can hear me and I hope that you should be able to join me and speak and, and, and have a good natter. Are you there? We're just connecting up now. Oh, fantastic. So I don't want to spoil too much about why George is here. I'm going to ask him to explain in a second. But the first thing I'm going to ask George is about why he recently became Twitter famous. Hi, George. Are you OK? Hello. I hope you can hear me properly. I definitely can. It is so lovely to have you on the show. What an absolute treat. So, George, would you be able to tell our listeners why you recently became Twitter famous? Well, firstly, thank you so much for uh, for bringing me me on. Um, obviously, we tried a few weeks ago, and that that didn't quite work. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. So, I I, I made a, a tweet to mm-hmm. talk about uh, how lucky I am. I went to a pupil referral unit for four years. Um, so, for all of my secondary education, essentially, and uh, this October, I started at Cambridge University, which is a, a I'm tremendously lucky and uh, incredibly grateful to my experience with the pupil referral unit system, um, to which I you know, attribute being here to massively. Wow, that's so interesting, George. And I am really looking forward to speaking to you and hopefully getting deep diving really into kind of a, your experience of a pupil referral unit and, and, and how it helped you. Uh, before we begin our, our, our interview, I'm just going to read a, a short message from one of our sponsors because we are incredibly lucky um, that this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Or visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. And I'll be honest, it's an incredible website. And if you're looking for things on alternative provision or behaviour, definitely give it a click and go and have a little look on their website because it's fantastic. Hi, George. So, George. What was your initial experience of school? Um, you know, did how 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 was that for you? Well, it it was pretty dreadful. Mm. Um, you know, I've I've always struggled with anxiety as long as I can remember. But it was the transition from primary school to secondary school that was totally unmanageable for me. Um, I've described it a few times as as you know feeling simultaneously like jelly and shaky and nervous. Uh, sort of on the outside but inside you're rigid and firm and you're trying to you know it's a it's a horrible feeling uh and you you get that for every person you spoke to mm-hmm. um you know you can't keep that up for five years and by, by christmas really of year seven so very quickly it became apparent i couldn't cope with the mainstream environment um i'd gone from in primary school i think enjoying school to some extent to secondary it just it just wasn't possible um and that was when I was very lucky to be uh, sort of shuffled towards the the AP system. And uh, that is luck because a lot of people don't get that opportunity uh, yeah. for all sorts of reasons. Definitely. So what, what was your experience of a pro like? Because obviously it's very different in the mainstream to a pro. So what was your experience like? Well, I, I, I'm happy to say my experience was very positive. Um, it, it never, it was, it was always difficult. Uh, anxiety doesn't go away. I may have got better better at managing it in no. the years since, but it, it's never <clears throat> totally, <clears throat> sorry, totally receded. Um, but it was so much better geared. We had much smaller classes, which helps. Um, and <clears throat> that allows the teachers to take a very personal approach. They can, they can tailor uh, their entire teaching style and what they're teaching around the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. For for people with sort of complex mental health needs, that's much more effective, I think, than sort of dusty rubrics on how you should teach. That might work for for most people, but don't work for all. Um, I think that individual attention, being able to 
and get to know a student and, and work out what you can sort of hone in on to to lift them upwards i mean quite often they'd find a subject or something to hook a student with and then improve the entire educational experience from that um that is something you couldn't do in a mainstream school because of you know how many students there are in a people referral unit they can and uh, to me that made all the difference totally changed the course of my life Wow. I mean, I, I often talk about this and I know colleagues who listen along have as well about the overcrowding of the of 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 the national curriculum and the, the complete pressures that mainstream colleagues are under to ensure that all of that curriculum is covered. And it just wouldn't be possible to to tailor absolutely everything, like you said, in a mainstream environment. And yet here we're seeing that when we do tailor things more and when we are able to reduce that um, that overcrowding that that really amazing things happen and that young people feel supported and able to learn in a in a, a safe and engaging environment um so how did access and approve help you then well I, I, if i'm totally honest the way it was going if i didn't i mean the absolute best case scenario was i wouldn't have passed any gcc's and that's best case um for me it totally transformed the entire trajectory of my life. I've said in a few interviews when, when just after I made the tweet and sort of got noticed, um, it was my history teacher that sort of, you know, used history because he knew it was it was the thing I was mostly interested in. Used it to try and, <clears throat> um, both as a sort of an incentive and also as you know, work it where you can, uh, sort mm. of. And then, I mean, now I'm sitting here doing a history degree. So that would never have happened. It, it, it's, that is what it, you know, it totally changed everything for me. And what it's, was the, what was the best experience for you then in terms of a, 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 a of, of being at Peru? Was it the fact that it was the history hook or was it more than that? It was more, I think the other thing is how sort of familiar they can be. Um, you know, the teachers and because there are so few students and because the teacher to student ratio is not what not one to one but much closer to that the relationship between students and teachers is much closer than it i think it is at mainstream um that not only makes it a comfortable environment but i also think it does a lot to encourage attendance and better behavior and you know giving more of a go of things because you 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 know and like the people you're with that is you know it's it's a, a nurturing environment and that's really important as well um mainstream uh, sp specifically i found sort of mental health provision in mainstream tends to be quite cold and very uh, slightly austere a lot of the time that isn't the case in people referral units and that makes a massive difference as well um if you don't have a good environment then what you're teaching doesn't matter it won't get through the mm -hmm. environment does so much and that was incredibly helpful as well so what was your journey at after Access and Pro? How, you know, where did you access further education? Well, I returned to a mainstream sixth form, the same school I left. Um, much better able to tackle the, um, the difficulties that were still there from mm -hmm. year seven, but were now much easier. You know, I was much better at handling them. Um, I also, I mean, I still got some support from my pupil referral unit. I visited a couple of times. Um, I got emails occasionally to check up. That was very valuable. Um, you know, it kept, even if it was only every couple of months, it kept me sort of connected in a very loose way, enough to give me my own space to move on, but also that I knew there was a there was support back, if you get what I mean. Yeah, of course. Um, my, my sixth form also was very good. I think mental health provision in schools, mainstream schools, has come some distance, even just in as long as I've been there. It's got a lot more to go, but it's sort of, you. you it felt to me, and it's a mix of being well primed to, to deal with it by the pupil referral unit, but also I think the um, a general societal shift towards understanding mental health a bit more, which is good. Um, uh, I had some fantastic teachers at my sick form. I still speak to a couple of them as well. Um, so that that is a fantastic. Uh, I, I had a I had a difficult time in sick form through anxiety. It was it was harder for me than the pupil referral unit was. Um, but I was able to do it. That looked that that's unbelievable going back to where I came from. 
you know, that's not normal. Uh, that, well, that's not expected, I should say. Um, I managed it because of the fantastic work the Pupil Referral Unit did, not just to get me academically through, but to prepare me, I think, for, for further life on with that, knowing that I'd, ha I'd still have anxiety and I'd have to, I'd have to get a handle on it as I went yeah. forward. Wow. So do you think that proofs play an important part within the education system now? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think there's this, and I'm guilty of doing it, occasionally, you know, in, to, to pit mainstream schools and uh, AP against each other, which is not productive, I don't They work very well and they work best when they're together. Yes. Um, you know, and, and the, 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 the model system, and I, there's all sorts of, you know, questions about whether this is right, but to send a student there for some amount of time and then send them back to the mainstream, which in theory is ideally fantastic if it can happen. And it, I've seen it happen occasionally. Mainstream schools, I think, you know, PRUs hold such an important point in terms of either being a short stay thing to get people back on track or a long term approach to try and uh, prepare someone for further education. Or, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, people referral units seem to have fairly consistently fantastic vocational options. That is really important. Mm. Um, I think the one thing that mainstream schools ought to get better with is engaging with pupil referral units in a way that isn't, we don't know what to do with this child anymore, take them, deal with them, they're your problem now, which I think there is an, an issue with. If they work together, as I think, I hope there's a shift towards now. I mean, anecdotally where I went, it does seem to be um, a much more constructive relationship since I left than when I was there you know there is a place for people referral units in the education system and it's it's next to sort of marching with mainstream education they they need each other to benefit everyone i completely agree and and i think it's something i'm really keen to to improve across the country really is the working relationships between alternative provisions and mainstream but why do you think then george cuz I'm really interested to know, and I've experienced this myself as a as a, a teacher working in AP, and particularly in a pro. But I, I suppose I'd ask you this question because your lived experience of having been to one is different to mine. Why do you think then that if there's so many positives that you've experienced from a pro, why is there so much negativity towards them? Do you think? So I think the first, the first, the the big thing is that when people think of alternative provision, they think of of and I, you know air quoted naughty kids. Which, mm. firstly, I promise you, there are no children in this country who just enjoy throwing chairs out of a window. There is always a reason underneath. The job of people referral units is to get to that, and to to use every educational sort of plank they've got to rectify that. Um, and, and also, I think we have a really awful habit of when we judge people for L units, we judge them by the students that go there, are sent there, are referred there, and then not by the people who leave, which would be a far more effective way. You would see the difference because it's huge for most yeah. people. Um, equally, I think it, it doesn't help that people in power really would like to rally against people referral units. There's terrible... The, the government's new scheme is not very good on both sides of the political divide. There are people demonising them for whatever reason. Um, I think PIUs often must feel like they're going at this alone. Um, mainstream schools have a habit of just dumping people there, and I hope that's changing. It should change. Um, but I, I think it's a reputation of naughty, badly behaved kids, which isn't fair. There's always something underlying and... I assure you, in most cases, from my experience, I'm sure from yours, the difference between the students who arrive and leave is is huge, and oh. people only people only see who arrives, and that's that's a shame. Oh, it's I mean it is it's it's absolutely staggering, and and I suppose I do see it from both sides of the coin, really, because I have worked in mainstream, and I have and I've got a lot of friends who are mainstream who are simply, you know, due to to cut government cuts, who we've you know don't have large classes of 30 children, no TA, um, you know, and pupils can be can demonstrate those challenging behaviours. It's It can be quite intense and stressful. And so a 
you know when that when that when there's a managed move when that when that pupil transitions over to a, a pro there's there's a there's a sense of relief but then it's on to the next pupil so i can understand sometimes why that link isn't always there but but it's like you said I, I i wish sometimes because i know how much mainstream colleagues would celebrate if they were able to see the progression of that pupil and see the difference afterwards and say wow okay you know that's incredible but they don't always get that opportunity do they because there's not that link there um which is quite frustrating but with that in mind do you think that um all teachers should have to have some experience whether as i mentioned before that's a, a visit a sabbatical a, a a training session in a pro i would i would love more teachers to have more experience with pupil frail units Partly this is why, you know, I've, I've, I'm taking every opportunity I can to get to talk about it, because I think a lot of the time it, it's just, it's not hostility. It's they, you know, they are so busy mm. with the schools as they are, that they do not have time to understand a, a, a system that is so different, you know, that, that and that's fair enough. You know, it's a, t I would, I'm not a teacher, obviously, but I can't imagine it's a fun time to be one a lot of the time at the minute, especially with the long shadow of COVID. So I understand why a lot of the time mainstream school teachers don't uh, don't have the the time or or whatever to engage. I wish they would, and I think this is this is why I think a people referral unit and a mainstream school partnership is so important because all I think all teachers would benefit from it. Because I left the school and then went back after my time in the people referral unit, I had people say, "What a." huge difference it was that's unusual to to see the student after so long absolutely um and I, I that's a unique situation i i think in general i mean in general even if all that happened is they would visit a student after their time there just once i think would do a lot to change perceptions um but i i i think and this is what i mean about the whole sort of symbiotic thing you people with other units can't get the attention they need until issues with funding and overcrowding in mainstream schools are sorted um ideally though i think more mental health aware and more ap aware teachers would be fantastic and and hopefully in the future that is what's going to happen do you do you think that there are lessons that mainstream colleagues can learn and mainstream schools in general can learn from alternative provision um i i think the 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 I mean, the big takeaway is a lot of the time, uh, out of compassion towards a student, and most teachers are fantastic, but there is still a big class of, you know, teaching thought that you have to be, there's, there's one particular head teacher in London who comes to mind who seems to think being nasty is the way you get through to children. It isn't. My experience in um, pupil referral units is that more than anything else, patience and understanding of pupil can do a lot, again, Mainstream school student, uh, mainstream school teachers are hamstrung by no money and about a million pupils each. So <laughs> I understand why this doesn't happen, but that I think is the biggest thing. Students are obviously individuals, and what will work for ninety percent of them fantastically is fine. But there is always going to be on the fringes students who aren't being caught by that. And to what I think the, a personal approach is so fantastic. Obviously, that's not always going to be possible in mainstream schools, even when you saw all the issues out. And that's why people referral units are important to exist as well. Um, but I think a per that personalised, um, compassionate approach that you get in people referral units is so important. And I understand why it can't all be imported into mainstreams, but I think there's aspects of it that would be really, really helpful for, for a lot of people. Definitely. And I think one of my worries is that obviously some of the statistics I read out before are are clearly demonstrating the rise in young children and young people who need alternative provision. And, and, and whatever that reason is for, whether it is behaviour, whether it is an SEMH need, whether it is SEND need, whether it's you know, mental health after, you know, after COVID and, and, and in the society that we live in now and the demands and the pressures that we're all under, it's clear and evident that more alternative provision is needed. And yet we're not there, are we? Do you think that the government needs to invest more in alternative provision and make that more accessible to young people? 
I think the most helpful thing would be to have a plan. I mean, it doesn't feel like, uh, what, last week they changed school schools minister again. Mm. It doesn't feel like there's any proper approach to people with failure units. It seems to be made up. And when the minister changes so often, that's a problem. They did have the plan, the delivering better value in SEND plan. Personally, I, I take great offence to that. You value a, a cattle or a house. You don't value a child's education. Their approach seems to be actually to cut money back at the moment, which is, in in my view, totally wrong. I'm very lucky Milton Keynes Council funds their pupil referral units relatively well. But in, in a lot of places in the country, they already have so abysmally small funding. And now the government wants to pull it back. And I'm not even convinced that, you know, the opposition has a plan either. It feels like that they're, they're in general, politically, there's no pupil referral unit AP approach that anyone has and as a result we're sort of the last it feels like uh, people referral units are sort of the they get to the bottom of the list of everything they need to do and then it's they get what's left and when things are as difficult as they are now that means pulling funding back which is t totally inappropriate I'm sure from your experience you could I mean funding is so important and there's not enough of it now so I don't know how you take it out without making a situation worse. Anecdotally, after COVID, the pupil referral unit I attended, enrolments have doubled. You know, the, the, the pressure on these uh, centres is huge now. It's gone up, it's shot up. And for the government now to turn around and say, we're going to deliver better value, which really does mean wrench money away, is, I, I, I think, just atrocious. Um, more funding is needed. And also, I think a change of attitude from the top would be good. Um, you know, if pupil referral units are mentioned by politicians, it seems to be in the context of they are they are pipelines to prison or whatever, which mm. is is unhelpful at best. Yes. Um, you know, even and that's not just the government. The shadow foreign secretary said the same thing. We have funding is the most important thing, but if you can change the narrative about them from the top, that would be helpful. And I under I mean, when we're not keeping an education secretary for more than 35 seconds, I get why it doesn't happen. But a better approach would be really valuable on a funding basis and on a sort of narrative basis, because we're really I, th I think that lets people for this down to be uh, students who leave, in my experience, tend to be really embarrassed of where they were to have that embarrassment that is you know being ashamed uh almost vindicated because politicians will s sort of saber rattle at pupil referral units is really really disappointing so more funding and a uh, more positive more positive stories about PIUs because there are lots yes absolutely Anna, just to let you know that you've got miss m in as a speaker as well fabulous thank you um we will come to you uh, miss m in a minute i just want to um just deep dive a little bit more with George first, if that's okay. Um, George, I, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there, particularly for me, um, around that stigma and that negativity that, that, that children and young people may also feel for having accessed um, alternative provision. I, that, for me, as a teacher in AP, um, is, is, it, it, it cuts me to the core, and I know it exists. I, I have to, you know, acknowledge that, but because... We should be celebrating these young people who have achieved and 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 overcome so many challenges um, by accessing a, 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 an AP. And, and for me, I, I, it's so hard because it's like you said, if from the top, the, the stigma and the negativity surrounding alternative provision is it, it is so negative, then how can we expect young people to celebrate where they've been when actually the outcome of them? overcoming challenges of them um moving on and, and and being successful in however that looks that's what matters uh, not not where they access the education but that young children and young people have had the opportunity to access education and i find it really frustrating as a teacher but but you are absolutely right that there is this this embarrassment and 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 worry about telling people after they've left that they've been and accessed ap when Actually, we should celebrate it, really, shouldn't we? we? We absolutely should. I mean, I'm sitting in Cambridge now, and if you put my academic history next to someone who went to maybe a very good private school, I can tell myself that to get here, I worked 
if I may say, probably quite a bit harder, emboldened by fantastic teachers at Pupil Reveal Unit. When my when I made the tweet and it was picked up by the by the news, a lot of uh, journalists, it was actually slightly depressing that this was considered newsworthy. And I wish it wasn't. I, I, I hope in the future that if I'd made that tweet in 10 years, that it would have got a couple of likes and everyone would have moved on. It, it shouldn't be as uh, sort of newsworthy as it is. And that, that's really sad. I also don't think it is. This happens much more often than people think. Um, but people are ashamed of saying where they come from. Um, you know, I used to lie and say I was from a from a school in places around Milton Keynes. It might have been convincing, but I often forgot which one I'd said, and they would say <laughs> several different places. People began to work it out. Um, you know, it it I this is something to celebrate. It's you know I've been really lucky to have gotten the support, to have had phenomenal teachers to have progressed into a mainstream school successfully and now to be here you know and that's that's why i'm so keen to really bang the drum of pupil referral units in every way i i can they are fantastic courses and and the fact that they are stigmatized is is deeply depressing and um i hope isn't the case forever and it it won't be i mean when i when the story came out i actually got messages from several people who are now standing for parliament and so basically saying, this is really important. It's not talked about enough. Thank you for saying it. So I hope that we are, as society in general, gets more welcoming around mental health. I, I really hope that's the way we're moving now. And that, as I say, in a decade, my tweet would not have picked up in the way it did. Wow. I mean, I guess really that does embody why you are so passionate about Prue's and, and what your hopes for education in the future are really isn't it that you know we 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 create a narrative around alternative provision and around Prue's that is is positive and life-affirming and and optimistic and and positive about the futures that are of young people children and young people that access them and you know and and we 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 eradicate that 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 uncertainty and that negativity around them because you know that you are you know a shining example of 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 what the power of AP which is exactly what this this whole show is about you are an absolute um a, a, an embodiment of it I mean how how are you finding Cambridge are, are you enjoying it you know what are your what are your plans for the future. Well, well, first, let me say, I, I might be, you know, I might have done very well out of PAU, but as I've said throughout all of this, the person to thank and to, to credit and to celebrate are the teachers who got me here. Phenomenal, you know, teachers in, it's an entire unsung sector of employment, teaching. And then you've got this core, if, you know, if teachers in general are unsung, then AP teachers are unhumped. No one pays them attention. They are fantastic. Um, I'm so lucky to have had them. Cambridge is, you know, Cambridge is a, a, a different, it's very different from Milton Keynes. Uh, yeah, I the imagine. Cow, the cows all move and there's no roundabouts, it's very strange. It's <laughs> beautiful. Um, it does take a lot of getting used to. And, you know, mm -hmm. not only am I from a, a different educational background, but I'm from a from a sort of lower income background as well, um, which, which makes this uh, sort of a doubly unusual experience from the wealthy private school um educated bulk of students which which does still exist but i've been well supported um really well supported i've got a phenomenal tutor here um i'm really enjoying the subjects the city is beautiful um which is also very i mean you feel you know doing a history degree you feel when you walk through cambridge it's very history heavy a lot of the time um it's a lovely city i am enjoying it it's taking a lot to get used to um it's not it, it, it occasionally it becomes very difficult it will it will probably be that way but i you know i'm still set up very well from the years i had in a pupil referral unit and, i was going to um, ask you that i was going to ask do you still use strategies that you learned at the pro well, I, now i remember when i first arrived there was a, a society event that i was going to go to and i got to the door of the bar they were hosting it in um and i got that feeling of of, of nerves and i couldn't do it and i, I turned around and went home um, which sounds like a like a, a failure, but then I went back the the next day, 
Now, that's not that impressive on the sounds of it, but that is a huge change from where I was. It was, you know, that wouldn't have been possible perhaps even, you know, two years ago. So I have been taught very well. I am much, you know, I still get hit by these massive waves of anxiety that are really difficult. But the I'm better able to dust myself off and give it another go. Um, that, you know, that resilience is, is really taken from my experience and the people referral unit. And, and that's just, that's very helpful. And it, it will, I should imagine, be with me for the rest of my, my life. I don't know what I want to do with it. Um, I hope I continue. I, 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 I'm so passionate about alter, alternative provision and, and the fantastic things it could do that I hope that I stick and, and continue to, to do that sort of thing um, in any way that I can and any way that professionally, you know, appears once I finish my degree. Um, you know, I, I, I owe so much to them and it's the least I can do in future life after Cambridge to continue um, waving the flag, really. Wow, George, that's absolutely inspirational. Um, I, I'm I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just completely blown away because it is. It you know I was always incredibly excited to have you on the show and to hear the perspective of a young person that's accessed AP, that's accessed a pro, and I think you have beyond doubt um, helped to shine a, a, a light on pros today and 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 the powerful impact and the the power of AP, which as I said before is is literally what this show is about. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. In today's educational environment, students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face, -face, online and blended learning courses. Canvas by Instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly, and access actionable data that drives student success. On the 24th to the 26th of January, 2024, Bet UK is back and even better for educators. New for 2024, Table Talks empowers educators to collaborate openly and connect deeply with like minded individuals in the education space, as well as tech user labs, the brilliant new tutorials, and working groups at BET, where technology users will learn how to get more out of their institution's tech from the top education technology experts in the world. Whatever your goal, you'll find it at BET 2024. Educators go free. Get your tickets today at www.uk.betshow.com forward slash visitor dash registration. This is Teachers Talk Radio and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The big political news this week was the launch of the DfE in England's consultation on how best to implement minimum levels of service in schools if teaching and support staff unions go on strike. The BBC reports that education unions who were involved in talks with government over MSLs called the announcement shameful. One of the two options being put forward is to guarantee that vulnerable children, those due to take exams, Children of critical workers and all primary school pupils can go into school on strike days. A leaked DfE document suggests that this amounts to 74% of pupils. In October, Education Secretary Gillian Keegan said MSLs would be introduced with the unions on a voluntary basis at first. But the government could use legal powers brought in earlier this year under the Strikes Act. The DfE says the plans will protect education. The consultation will last nine weeks. 
All four teaching unions involved in talks reacted angrily to the announcement. Much of the media focus in recent days has been on the inquest into the death of Ruth Perry. The Guardian featured a report focusing on comments made by colleagues of the late head teacher, which focused on her evident distress during the days of the inspection. Much has been made of comments from Ofsted inspectors that Mrs Perry was upset, tearful and looked like she was in pain. The inquest began after Mrs Perry's family discovered that its bid for legal aid had been rejected, but a crowdfunding campaign saw donations totalling more than £63,000. Behaviour in schools has also been a hot topic on both sides of the England-Scotland border. The Dunfermline Press reported that Fife Council's education chiefs are trying to curb a rise in violence in schools, but they don't believe in negative consequences. Instead, children learning about bullying should be an empowering experience. In a new version of the anti-bullying policy, the aim is stated that children do not bully others because they understand the harm it causes and choose not to cause such harm. It goes on to say where children do choose to bully, we need to engage with them educationally, supportively and restoratively rather than punitively. Comments on the paper's website, however, appear to show disapproval of the policy, with one comment describing it as utter nonsense and another saying it was psychobabble. The draft policy has been issued to head teachers, guidance staff and educational psychologists for their views, before schools are asked to create a personalised policy for their setting based on the final draft. Meanwhile, over the border in England, The Guardian reports that head teachers are describing a culture of non-compliance among pupils and parents. Whereas once a parent who was called into school to discuss concerns was likely to be broadly supportive of teachers' decisions, now heads are saying parents more often side with their child and take to social media to register their feelings. Many heads also say that behaviour has changed from having to deal with lesson disruption to managing internal truancy, as pupils come to school to socialise but refuse to attend lessons to learn. Some leaders also highlighted an increase in verbal abuse and swearing. Head teachers also pointed out that whilst challenging behaviour is nothing new, non-compliance is on the increase, and the reduction in the availability of specialist support services has made matters worse. One leader summed up the current situation. Since Covid, people seem to be far less tolerant and that includes pupils and parents. Popular quiz show University Challenge is in the news as the BBC reports that a Christmas episode has been pulled after two contestants complained about a lack of provision for their disabilities. According to the report, contestants were not provided with promised audio description for visual images or subtitles to help with audio processing. The BBC agreed to withdraw the episode after the complaints were received. Finally, the BBC features a report on a civil servant who quit her Whitehall job to retrain as a teacher. The former employee of the DfE began teacher training in 2022, and Ms Melbourne is just one example of over 35s joining the profession, according to charity New Teach. Research suggests that recent graduates are shunning the profession, but older people are stepping up to fill the gap. Figures also suggest that older starters stay in the profession longer than the national average and are more representative of society in terms of gender and ethnicity. Could this be a solution to a recruitment crisis? This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Um, I would just like to ask you a couple of sort of thought-provoking questions, if that's OK. If you could give a message to teachers in AP, what would it be? I, th I think at short it would be thank you. I mean... I, I, you know, from being there, I know it's not easy at all. Um, and there are always points where it gets very difficult for whatever reason. Um, all teachers have the potential to, to be life changing for individual students. But I think teachers at pupil referral units are life changing in almost every instance. Um, and I think, you know, my I personally am so in, in such deep gratitude to the teachers I had. Um, just, just keep keep doing what you're doing. It's phenomenal. You're really putting lives back on track. You're 
criminally, criminally unsung. But the things you do are just phenomenal. So thank you uh, from a former, former pupil referral unit student for everything you did for me and for everyone I knew. Um, you're just a phenomenal, phenomenal force in, in education. That's amazing, George. And, and if you had a message for young people, children and young people who are maybe about to access AP, who maybe are already there, given that we've talked about the stigmas and, and the, the, the anxiety they might feel around telling people, what would, the, what would your message be to our young children, young people who are accessing AP? Well, it, well it's the end. Uh, no, sorry, that's the wrong way around. It's the start of your education, not the end. And um, you, to be there, you have not, you know, you've not been defeated. You've not been written off. This is where you start and it, it will be difficult. I can't, I'd love to say that it's going to be easy. It will always be difficult for students in pupil referral units, but you can still leave and do really whatever you put yourself to. You can achieve what, whatever you put on that pedestal saying, I want to do this. It's always still possible teachers in pupil referral units will work almost always work ridiculously hard to get that to happen you have to do the work too um but i mean when i when i went on to when i spoke about this on the news i got a couple of messages from people in my position who were in pupil referral units and now in sick form or are in pupil referral units um that i must admit maybe maybe cry a couple of them uh, you know it keep keep going um, this is only the only the start, and um, don't write because a lot. I mean, from my experience, don't write yourself off, because it's very easy to do that and to lose all confidence and hope or, or or passion or care for the future. Don't do that. It's so easy to do, especially when the whole culture is so negative. Um, this this negative fever around people with frail units, the people that hurt are the students. Um, that's why it's so damaging. Just you can still achieve whatever you wish to achieve that's absolutely brilliant George I can't I genuinely can't thank you enough for coming on I don't think I could have ever conveyed to to listeners the experience of a young person accessing a pro and you have just done it so beautifully today um I'm genuinely really grateful for you taking the time today to come and speak to our teachers talk radio um listeners please um please please carry on listening we're, we're gonna carry on with our our show but if you would like to speak again or jump in at any point uh, and contribute please do because we would just love to continue to have your feedback throughout the show thank you george thank you so much for having me it's been fantastic um, i will stay listening fabulous thank you very much wow unbelievable there i couldn't have asked for anybody to sum it up better than george and what an absolute inspiration he is to now be studying at cambridge and and going on to incredible things i mean for me that's such an accurate depiction of the power of ap that for lots of our young people it is not a failure nobody has given up it's just the start of a different journey and that journey is still as valuable and is still as important um i asked some of the pupils in my pupil referral unit why they liked ap i also asked them um what it was about an AP, what it was about a PRU that, that worked for them. And, and interestingly, it, it's actually very similar to George in some ways. It, it was things like the smaller classes, more staff to be able to talk to, time to process lessons and the curriculum. Now, I understand for mainstream colleagues, and I say this as someone that's been in mainstream, it is incredibly difficult and challenging because until young people access AP they are within they are typically within the main body of a mainstream school and the ability to cater lessons individually the ability to reduce an overcrowded curriculum to give time for or extended time rather for processing is is near non-existent because the pressures for mainstream colleagues are always there but we can see from, from George's feedback, from the feedback of some of the children and young people that I work with, that these key elements, the smaller classes, the time, the additional staff is exactly what's needed. And yet that's exactly what's missing from mainstream. And that is not teacher's fault. That is not the school staff's fault. That is an absolute failing of our system as a whole. And, and that's what puts pressure on people. Um, 
if there are so many positives about AP, if there are so many positives about Prue's, why, like George said, are we not having more of these discussions? Why are our governments underfunding AP? Why are we not creating more? Why are we not having these conversations in more detail? Also, what is it like for staff that are working in AP? How did they feel about the cuts and the challenges and the, the almost desperation to increase alternative provision offers when there are actually so very few for an incredible amount of children who need them? Um, my next guest is Miss M, Miss Macy, who actually works in alternative provision. Before I speak to her, I would just like to again thank our sponsors for today. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? You can use code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advise, advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. I cannot stress how important it is to, to go and click on that website because there are some incredible books that explore behaviour, explore SEMH issues, that explore the kind of topics that we as teachers want to discover more on. So please do go and give them a visit. Now, as I mentioned before, we, we all know that I'm incredibly passionate about AP and I think today our lovely guest George has incredibly summed up the power of AP. We know that we need more alternative provisions in this country. As I said to you before, the statistics around suspensions, exclusions, young people accessing alternative provision is on the rise. But what's it like to work in one? What's it like to face that stigma, not as a pupil, but as a teacher? Well, hopefully we can deep dive into that with my next guest, Miss Macy. Hi, Miss Macy. Hopefully you're going to be able to speak. Hi. It is lovely to have you on today. So um, for our listeners who may not know you, you obviously work in alternative provision, don't you? I do, yeah. I work in a people referral unit. Okay, thank you. And and, and what, what's your experience of working in AP? Well, coming from my, my like my university um, life, I, was, I, I did mainstream education. That's kind of, that's the the qualification that I had and I actually coming out of that I had very little knowledge about APs I didn't even know that a pupil referral unit was a thing until I went on to supply um, and the difference kind of teaching in a mainstream to teaching it in an AP is so so different it does come with its daily challenges but I absolutely love going in every day. It's that it's the unknown or oh, what's today going to bring. Um, and it's like, how lovely is it where you can see a pupil that's coming to you who has been struggling in their mainstream. And then, you know, you do all that hard work with them. And by the end of their, their journey within that pupil referral unit, wherever they may go next, whether it's back to their mainstream or whether it's onto a, a more permanent AP, you know, it's lovely to see that change in them and how, like, you've had an impact and been able to help them. I absolutely love working in AP. I wouldn't change it for the world. I, I, I mean, that's that's so lovely to hear. I, I just kind of want to pick up on one thing that you sort of talked about then, mm -hmm. which was that before you went on to supply, you had no idea, despite having the, a teaching qualification, that um, a, 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 a pro existed. And... Um, the reason I ask that is because earlier on in the week, I, I, I sent a tweet out um, to trainees and ECTs asking if they felt they'd had enough training and experience in alternative provision. Mm -hmm. And the statistics were, for me, were really shocking. So 93% of the poll said that they didn't feel that they'd had enough training on alternative provision and 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 you know obviously everything that comes with that and it, it it got me to thinking really that you know from my own teacher training from yours from from lots of people who have contacted me via dm have said you know within their university course 
or whether they've done uh, it, it through a different via a different method. There may be a lecture or a, you know a, a half a day CPD on different provisions, if that, and that's it. Some haven't had any at all, like yourself, where there was there was no real kind of exploration of other avenues of education. And that, as somebody that's worked in mainstream and somebody that's worked in AP, um, and, and I'm very fortunate that, I, you know, I've worked in SEND schools, SEMH, I, I, that really worries me because, you know, it if you don't understand the journey of of the children you're teaching and and what those outcomes might be and and how that looks if they move on how can you best support them in mainstream until they get on that journey um do do you feel that from your experience that teachers ECTs trainees have enough experience of alternative provision Oh, absolutely not. Like when I was um, going through my qualification, um, we did have some lectures on SEND um, mm-hmm. and SEMH. We had, in because uh, my, uh, my degree was four years and across that four years, I did one week, five days in an SEND school. That was it. Um, and, you know, the university believed that that was enough to give me the experience going forward and actually I really thoroughly enjoyed that week more so than I enjoyed um, my mainstream placements because it was so different and I wanted more and that was one of the one of the things at the end of the at the end of the course that I did say to the lecturers in in the final feedback that we do need more experience surrounding SEND um, and AP schools because uh, you're sending you're sending ECTs out into a into a big wide wide teaching world with no idea of the processes to support children within schools. Um, it's scary to to know. Kind of, I've I've spoken to lots of ECTs in their kind of their first couple of years, and um, it's it's quite scary to know that some of them don't actually know, also don't know that a, that a pro is a thing. Um, and they don't know what to do to, to support children. Um, and then when, when those children are sent to a different school to support their needs, they never hear back from them. They don't know, you know, they're, they're, there's no follow up. And it is quite scary, unfortunately. I do think that that needs to change. I think there does need to be lots more training on SEND and, and AP schools and even knowing what the processes are to support children going, you know, to for a placement in a pupil referral unit, you know, what what needs to happen to for that child to support them moving forward? It, it definitely needs to change. It's really interesting you should say that. I was speaking to some colleagues last weekend who um, work in quite large scale secondary schools, and I was asking them, you know, do you know the process of of what happens of of how young people come to you know come to AP Mm -hmm. and they said no um you know we're we're so busy we're 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 we're, we're dealing with so many young children and young people that you know when for whatever reason a young person needs to access AP or or you know on however that looks whether that as we said before is because of EHCP's exclusions whether it's because of SEMH needs and, and anxiety whatever however that journey looks to get them there once they're out of the classroom there's I, I don't know I just know that they're not in my class anymore and and it's not it's not um a, a sort of a, a a negative thing as in they don't want to know it's just it's it's on to the next pupil and, and supporting that pupil who maybe needs some help and it isn't you know it isn't able to fully access that mainstream classroom and the demand and pressure on mainstream colleagues is so huge that it is hard to kind of have the time have the headspace to be able to understand that journey to AP and yet it's absolutely essential and I think when when polls and and, and ECTs and trainees obviously talking to yourself and, and from feedback I've had are saying we don't feel we've had enough training in SEND we don't feel we've had enough training in SEMH we don't really know the alternative routes for education or how children 
access alternative provision there's a big gap there and it, it kind of compounds what george talked about before and what i mentioned at the beginning of the show around the negativity is mm-hmm. some of the negativity around ap because of fear because it's fear of the unknown because you go oh i don't really know about that i've heard it's not great i i i, I don't want to go there don't want to know anymore do, do, yeah it's really hard, isn't it, for mainstream colleagues, because to find the time to go out and visit an AP and to have that quality experience of AP would be difficult. But do you think it's something that, as a, you know, I would say the government need to look at and that the education system as a whole needs to allow staff the time, whether that's mainstream visiting AP or AP visiting different forms of ap do you think we need to build that time into into teachers timetables and into their cpd definitely so like one one of the things that um that george said was like the partnership between like mainstreams and an ap it needs to be like better and like you know but one of the things that i'd love to say i mean i probably would never happen but i'd love it is in an ect is like the first year is whether they choose to work in a mainstream or a SEND school, they they partner up with an AP and they go and have, you know, a big chunk of experience shadowing teachers in AP just to see how they communicate with those pupils as well. You know, what does that, how does that school run and take that knowledge back to their school? You know, AP teachers have a plethora of knowledge on how to support pupils whether that is pupils with extremely complex needs whether that's pupils with SEMH um, difficulties whether that you know all of these different things we've got everything there we've got like a massive toolbox and we're just we're eager to show people and I do think you know it would help if ECTs did come and they didn't, you know, I'm not expecting them to to teach and lead in a classroom, but just to shadow teachers, just to get the experience and not for five days, because you can't really get a, a big wide picture in five days, you know, have a good chunk of time um, and then go back and, and share that knowledge with everybody else. And I feel like that would give those teachers as well a little bit you know, their own tools then to, to support the children within their mainstream who may be displaying, you know, complex needs and SEMH um, needs as well. So I do think that, you know, that there needs to be a big change with that as well. I think teachers do need to have more experience in a variety of different AP settings, definitely. I hugely agree. I mean, I, I want to stay realistic because mm-hmm. I'm really aware lots of listeners are mainstream and can't stress enough that you know I I recognize you know I work quite closely with a lot of mainstream colleagues and I I know that I know the 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 strains that they face and the the challenges that they face and I don't think anyone is sat here saying okay in an overcrowded curriculum you're going to be expected to go off topic and, and yeah. tailor things to just that one learner because that is simply not possible when you've got 30 plus children in a classroom and no TA or if you're in secondary and you've got a really complex class of 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 of, of key stage three um mm-hmm. you know you, you know we I, I recognize that but I, I hugely agree that I think there's something about working collaboratively sharing good practice sharing strategies that you can model and then potentially adapting some of the offer if po- if and where possible um I I massively think that you know sharing strategies because we know that we know you know we, we talk on this show all the time about you know the first thing we do is a check-in how are you how's your week been why because feedback from from listeners and from edge of twitter across you know <laughs> across the globe we know that teachers are struggling we know that there is a rise in, in challenging behavior we know that like george said you know resilience is is low for for, for some children we know that you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to labour the point, but we know that COVID has had a massive effect on our young people. And we know that we now face more challenges than ever before. And so when our mainstream colleagues are having to face challenging behaviours in the classroom, unmet needs, SEMH needs, it, working with alternative provision, and, and, and you know, from, from my experience proves, is vital because those strategies can be really positive. And sometimes they're really small and absolutely 
able to be implemented into a mainstream classroom. And I know from my own experience, I've sometimes had mainstream colleagues come and afterwards they've gone, oh, I, you know, that I, I can do that. That's that's not a problem. I can absolutely do that in the in the classroom. And I say, yes, you absolutely can. Yeah. It, it's such a small change, but it but for that pupil, it will be it will be hugely beneficial. But it's that again, that stigma, isn't it? That you know, oh, in AP, you know, they just do their own thing, and the curriculum's so small, and you know, and 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 for I've I've challenged mainstream colleagues who were under the impression that that alternative provisions don't offer a wide curriculum and yet many many do um and so i would massively agree with you i think if one tip away for listeners today if if i know time is tough at uh, times are tough i know that you everyone is time poor but if you can reach out to your local alternative provision particularly if you're a you know if you're a uh, an LA school see if there's any opportunity go and speak to your line manager or your SLT about the opportunities to develop those relationships because actually it might make a huge difference within your own classroom because the reality is before these children and young people get to where they need to be which is that alternative provision because we celebrate that it's not a negative they are in a mainstream setting and lots of them can't manage in that mainstream setting and you're dealing with that every day so I would just stress and, and plead with you that if you have the time or, or are able to factor that time into your timetable to make those links with alternative provisions and see what support or strategies or modeling you can do um that said obviously you know it's it it's it, it can be still be challenging in alternative provision. Yeah. What what are you know what are some of the challenges that 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 you found from working in AP? Um, it's like massive. Like a lot of it would be to do with like the funding. I know obviously there are just cuts happening all over the place. Mm. Um, and it is funding is a big thing. You know, when when you're trying to struggle getting the funding to get resource to support these children and the government just don't recognize that it is difficult when you're going well that problem could be resolved if i had this resource but there's no funding to get those resources or there's not enough funding to get as many resources as you need so you might have for example um if if, if a whole class needs uh, ear defenders because they can't manage big loud noises um you know and, and the funding is so tight it's it's a case of okay well actually classes can only have like two or three ear defenders each and you're sat there going well which child gets that mm -hmm. and that is that is a massive you know challenge and in a frustration for me because i know that if if the government actually recognized the the important role that ap plays in the education system and funded it properly we'd have less of these challenges um do you, think just... do you think there needs to be more alternative provisions built made developed across yeah. the country definitely you know we are struggling um working in a pupil referral unit you know we are almost like a stepping stone pupils come to us because they're they're struggling in a mainstream setting or they've been permanently excluded from a mainstream setting they come to us for a shorter period of time before going forward on their education journey whether that's back to a mainstream or whether that's going forward um but what we're finding at the moment is that children are having to stay with us longer because there's no spaces in ap and that's another thing that you know teachers were all crying out that there needs to be more ap settings made so that these children have a place to go because lots of them are very aware that they they're only with us or meant to be with you know a, a pupil referral unit for a short time so it's it's one of those like they know they're on a waiting game until they go to their next placement and it's not fair on them to keep them for so long um and you know with the anxiety of that as well before they go somewhere so there does need to be a lot more AP settings made you know even if that is creating a DSP within a mainstream school 
um, so that even that mainstream then can access the, the DSP section of that school to, to support the children within mainstream as well. Absolutely. And just for listeners who maybe don't know what DSPs are, they're designated specialist provisions. And typically you might refer to them as a unit within your school whether or a nurture base. But also they can be uh, specialist provisions that are almost like mini mini proofs that are mini APs that are, are within um within a within a mainstream setting. Um, and I know that there are you're right, there are there are some councils that are really working on that now. And I know some within the Northwest who are quite heavily investing yes. in creating um bases within mainstream schools, but actually numbers are limited and already before they're even opened, they're hugely oversubscribed. And so there absolutely does need to be more and more investment and development into AP because we're seeing so many young people who are struggling with the, the demands of mainstream education and our mainstream yeah. colleagues are crying out saying, we, we, we know these young people need somewhere different. Our children and young people are saying, this isn't the right place for me and I'm going to show you that it's not the right, right mm-hmm. place for me. Our, our families and our parents and carers are saying, what's the next step here and how do I best support my child and our APs are saying we're at, we're at full capacity we can't take any more what do we do and and in the middle of all that is that child and that young person and, and it's it's a ripple effect isn't it and it's like what George said before you know it's not the end of a journey it should be the start and yet yeah. if we're trying to challenge the stigma around APs how can we do that if 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 there isn't a place for our young people to go because they're full um, yeah. and I think you know I, I you know I know we share very similar views and I share them with George as well that you know we do need to massively we need to have these conversations about alternative provision no teacher should should not know what a pro is and yeah, no exactly. and and no no government or, or or department for education should be talking nev- negatively about um, provisions that they have no experience of. Um, and you know, I, if any, if there are any uh, MPs listening today, you know, I would welcome you to come along to um, to to my alternative provision, to my PRU. You know, drop a DM, happily to take you around and show you the power of what a PRU can do. Miss <laughs> um, Macy, Megan, have you faced any stigma in telling people that you work at a PRU? Oh, all the time. Really? Um, you know, even even if it's like going on on training courses, you know, it's teachers who don't know how a pupil referral referral unit works, but they may have sent a child there, and they're like, "Oh yeah, they were really bad when they were at our school. I bet your school's full of it." And I'm like, "Oh no, not really, because yes, they may have struggled." But that's just their communication with you saying that they're struggling. They come to us and their needs are, you know, we're, we're meeting their needs a little bit better because it's a smaller environment and that's where they need to be. So actually, no, and I absolutely love my job and I'd never change it for the world. I'm constantly challenging that stigma all the time because they just think it's a naughty school. And it's really sad as well that it's not just teachers do that parents who whose child may be starting at at whatever school they already have that stigma as well they're like oh yes they're being sent to a naughty school like this is not a naughty school this is a school that is built to try and meet the needs of your child they are set they are shouting out and screaming that they're struggling where they are so they're being sent here to help them and quite a lot of time once a child is with us and they've been with us for a little bit, you know, so sometimes they can be with us for, for a week. And what's lovely to hear is a parent who used to think this is a naughty school is now suddenly turning around and telling me I've seen a massive change in them. They're happy to come to school. They're, they're, you know, they're, there's a big change in their behaviour at home as well. They're happier, um, you know, and they apologise for, for ever thinking that it was a naughty school because they can see the difference in it. And I also I use those those kind of success stories to to challenge, you know, colleagues at the uh, you know at mainstreams or even kind of the you know the the general public who try and say that it's not. I'm like actually, if you spoke to the parents of pupils who come to these schools, you'll have a completely different picture. But like George said, when there are 
you know, the powers that be within the government are speaking negatively? Or what are the general public going to think? Mm. You know, so that needs to be, you know, people like George and like yourself and like lots of other teachers, we need to start challenging it, but we need a platform to be able to do it and show how amazing APs are. And I really hope that Teachers Talk Radio is is part of that because, you know, allowing us to do this show today and, and promoting it and, and letting listeners learn more about um, AP and Prus it, it is so important. I mean... This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. In today's educational environment, students and teachers are juggling a mix of face-to-face, online and blended learning courses. Canvas by Instructure helps teachers navigate these diverse learning experiences with a user-friendly virtual learning environment that offers flexible access to courses and a consistent learning experience, all while streamlining everyday teaching processes. The world's best schools and universities are using Canvas to create dynamic courses, collaborate seamlessly and access actionable data that drives student success. On the 24th to the 26th of January, 2024, Bet UK is back and even better for educators. New for 2024, Table Talks empowers educators to collaborate openly and connect deeply with like minded individuals in the education space, as well as tech user labs, the brilliant new tutorials, and working groups at BET, where technology users will learn how to get more out of their institution's tech from the top education technology experts in the world. Whatever your goal, you'll find it at BET 2024. Educators go free. Get your tickets today at www.uk.betshow.com forward slash visitor dash registration. You've talked a little bit there about some of the positive and the changes. What are the biggest positives for you? Um, so one of like the biggest positives I think is is when a, a pupil comes to comes to us and you know they they try to display the the, the behaviours that they used to display at their other school because that's that's all they know at that moment is you know the behaviours that they displayed at the mainstream is the reason that they're here and they don't that you know they've not kind of settled in yet and then suddenly they realise oh it's different and then they're settled and you know they're they're enjoying their learning and everything and just seeing that change in a pupil is absolutely amazing and that's one of the positives that I'll always take away or sitting down for parents evening and seeing the joy on parents faces when they go I've never seen my child produce so much work that's oh it just it melts my heart all the time that's incredible um so I'm going to set you a bit of a challenging question now. Um, okay. I'd like to read a message from our sponsors. Um, and while I do that, I'm going to ask you this. I would like you to think and to sum up Pro in three words. Okay. So this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Really important sponsor. Thank you so much. And as I say, there's such a wealth of of information and and, and books available there. Please do click on the link and and go and um, go and have a little explore because, you know, it really will benefit your professional development. So, Megan, uh, moving back onto my challenge, could you sum up a pro in three words for me? Yeah. Uh, do you know what? It, it took me all of two seconds because <laughs> I just I knew I knew exactly what three words and that is powerful, impactful, 
and valuable. I love that. Powerful, impactful, valuable, such important words there to describe it. And and I can't thank you enough really for for um for giving your perspective today as a teacher and and you know and 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 how we can support mainstream colleagues and what lessons we can learn from AP you know there's no better person to talk about it than somebody that's lived that experience and yourself and George have done that brilliantly today and um, oh, I really hope you'll stay on the line because um I'd really love you to jump in and, and contribute some more of the show um I have got another speaker waiting to come on um our lovely Paul but but as he's coming on now can I just say Megan thank you so much today for your contribution it's been absolutely fantastic thank you Oh, thank you for having me. No problem at all. Paul, are you there? I'm here, Anna. How are you? Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. I would love to get your perspective on this as a as a mainstream colleague, you know, and the, the power of AP and, and your thoughts on the show today. Yeah, it's been a brilliant show, actually. And I think, I think AP and mainstream are coming closer and closer together all the time, to be honest. Um as a mainstream teacher, I can't stress enough to mainstream colleagues, you you have to know these strategies. You have to. There's there's no funding coming your way. There's very little support, but children are still coming your way who need your help in various ways. And um, especially I've found out I found out a lot more strategies this year because of the the range of children I've got in, uh, in my class this year and range of backgrounds and everything else. To have these strategies already in your locker when these children arrive will make your lives a million times easier, but also make the child's experience a million times easier and more enjoyable and manageable as well. Definitely. And I've been lucky. I've been lucky that I've got a couple of one-to-ones with children in my class who've got um, EHCPs. However, they're not the only children who say deserve one, require one. Mm-hmm. They're not going to get it because their needs aren't at the extreme level that you seem to have to be now in order to get that support and that help. But those strategies still play a massive part in their everyday lives and it's it's so true isn't it Paul you know that and I keep stressing it I, you know I, I feel very fortunate to work in AP it, it, you know it's it's where my heart lies but you know I recognize in mainstream colleagues that before these children are able to move on whether that is to a PRU whether that is to an SEMH school whether that is to an SEND school or many of the range of alternative provision that are out there they are typically unless their school refuses or there's a different plan in place typically in a mainstream environment and and so I I kind of find it perplexing that as a as as, you know as an educational offer we're not we're almost not allowed to work more closely with each other because really you guys are supporting these young people before they ever get to us and we need to share that dialogue and that that those you know those strategies and those approaches but if we don't build that into teachers timetables if we don't allow that cpd to happen if we don't forge links with those local provisions how how do we ever how do we ever do it how do we yeah. how, how, do, how do things change and um, it's and- really hard because i you know obviously without getting too personal what what are your opportunities like to go and see different alternative provisions? Is that ever built into your timetable? No, it's it, it's not. And, but that's that's probably from from both sides. To be yeah. fair, um, yeah. like George was saying, like George was saying before, the the demands on all teachers, um, not just mainstream, but in obviously there's red tape paperwork. There's a million and one things that you know take up our allocated hours, and then there's only so many hours that you could actually go to an AP and and be there when the children yeah. are there as well to to sort of get that experience. So it does it sort of requires teachers to to push it more, um, and head teachers to be willing and cooperative with others. I mean, the thing is as well. 
the, um, one child who I've got on an EHCP has had that since since May this year, and he yeah. joined us. Um, oh God, he's been with us at about eighteen months at least. Um, it's required. It's required the powers that be to say, well, are you doing these things? And then meetings with um, with heads in AP or, you know, and people from the council and everything else, meeting after meeting after meeting and saying, have you done this? Have you done this? And the list is is endless. It really is because it, you don't get a place easy. No. And this this, this, um, this boy needs... I would support as much as possible, but there's only so much that we can do. It's a small yeah. school. There's not much space, you know. It's and you need you need places to go, and you need people that he can be with when he can't um, manage the thirty three children in class, if you like. Yeah, of course. Oh, it can be it can be difficult, but and this is the frustrating thing. To... You know, this is the frustrating thing that there are then children who need to move on and absolutely need to access an AP mm. so that they can thrive and 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 you know go on on their educational journey. And there's nowhere for them to go because the APs are full. Oh and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's you know, and then and then for mainstream colleagues, they're you know they're thinking well. <laughs> There's not much more we can do. The impact on the child, the parents, the the, the school. It, it it's it it's really difficult, isn't it? And it's a real worry. I think it's in, it's incredible. The I mean, I've <laughs> there's only so there's so much that I've had to do. However, to prove that we've used all of these strategies, we put all of these things in place. Mm-hmm. Um, there's incredible red tape and forms and files and everything else that head teacher, family support worker were, I mean, that's huge. She's a massive part of our school. I don't know what we would do without her. Um, I've had to go through to prove that we are doing everything we can for this child who clearly needs more than, than we can provide. So we're feeling bad in the fact that we can't do some of those things that he needs, but we're doing everything we can. And we've got to prove that over and over and over again until they come back and say, well, have you tried this one? Have you tried this one? Whereas if APs and mainstream schools work closer together on a regular basis, I think there would be more trust there from the powers that be to say, yeah, actually, you've got this relationship with the, you know, with this AP and they've already shown you that these strategies are the best things to use and you already use them anyway for other children. So we quickly know that this child's going to need more than you are actually giving because you're giving everything as much as possible that an AP would provide. I think that is such a, a valid point and such a, I've got to be honest, Paul, such, you could put it much better than I could, but that's absolutely right. I think, you know, working together and then that trust from the powers that be, you know, from the LA, et cetera, that yes, all avenues have been explored, explored because we've worked together and, I think this is, you know, this is the, the 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 main thing of the show today is about the power of AP and the fact that, you know, that there is there are things that can be learned from alternative provision, but there are absolutely things that can learn from mainstream as well. And I think together we become we become an unstoppable force, but we 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 that those relationships need to be developed further and we need time and opportunity to because at the end of the day we do this for the children and when we can't find those forever schools or those alternative provisions, however you want to phrase it. It's the children that's, that, you know, that, that suffer. And that's not what we do this job for, is it? We do it to help. And when we can't help, we, we acknowledge that and we say, right, we need to move on. And yeah, I think you've, you really hit the nail on the head for me there thank you Paul um I want to thank everyone for today thank you to all the listeners thank you to all the amazing guests and the amazing speakers what an incredible show I feel so lucky to have been able to present this today especially when it's a topic that is so close to my heart um thank you very much everyone for listening if you get one takeaway from today make those links with APs see how they can support you and let's shine a better light on alternative provision because there are inspirational stories just like George's. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. 
You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.